So today we're going to be talking about the five core childhood wounds that you may have experienced. Maybe you have one of them. Maybe you have a couple. Maybe you have all five. This is yeah. not like Pokemon where you're trying to catch them all, but you know there are some people who have them all. And Pokemon uh, was a great game. Well, we, I never played it. I just oh, well, it sucks for you. Reference. So we're going to talk about how these wounds were created, how they show up in your life. And then we're going to start sharing the most important part and the most common question that we get, which is how do we start healing? Well, I think it's important too. like, you know, I think, and you know this because you've been around me now for six years. I mean, I got, I believe I tat, I believe um, all five of these, I went through all five of these with, you know, what you had seen. And we've talked about it on this show, you know, you know, in regards to my family. And I think a lot of people, you know, um, go through these, but um, at the same time, like I had no idea. And I think it's really interesting um, when we break these down, like there's probably going to be a lot of aha moments for people who are listening because, you know, um, a lot of, you know, these are so, I don't want to say they're subtle, but they're very, very, um, they, they happen a lot. And you'll notice when we start going through these five core wounds that, they, um, you know, they, it seems like they're, they're cyclic, you know, like it would happen, like it was the same thing that would happen over and over again, just with different characters or different situations. And I think it's important for everybody to understand how to, that's listening to understand, you know, and identify where this happened in their life, because, you know, part of our rise method in regards to, you know, breaking the cycle and ultimately like, you know, beginning to kind of, you know, once you break the cycle, beginning to obviously step into, a life, you know, that's completely different than the one that you either grew up in or are living, you know, in inner childhood healing is, you know, one of the massive steps of that. So we're beginning to break this down into five of the childhood wounds that we go over with our clients or that you specifically go over with one-on-one -on -one clients um, and helping them navigate not only what happened, but specifically how to start um, taking the emotion out of uh, and the pain out of, you know, stopping us and blocking us from what it is that we want to achieve because I personally going through these um kept hitting a wall I guess and you know I'd hit this wall and no matter how hard or how focused or how motivated or whatever you know adjective I think that's an adjective that I wanted to use um is that an adjective or a verb that's bothering me anyway so um you know I would you know, no matter whatever it was that I did, if I didn't break free from the childhood trauma that I experienced, I never got past a certain point. So I think it's important for people to know that what these five are and ultimately give them, um, you know, help them start breaking through these. Because if you don't break through these, you really don't end up going anywhere. And I experienced that over and over and over again before I did this process with you. And also keep in mind that you may have more than one, but there might be one that is kind of at the top. Like I, I like to think of trauma and our wounds sometimes almost like a like a bucket, right? And you might have one wound at the bottom of the bucket, but the wound at the top, and it's not mixed, right? It's like segmented. And so for me, for a long time, my abandonment wound was so intense that I didn't realize that I had other wounds underneath it. And so when I discovered the five core childhood wounds, I was like, I have abandonment, but I don't have the other four. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I really dove into healing the abandonment wound, my humiliation wound came out massively. Right. And so mm -hmm. you might become aware of these five core childhood wounds at different times in your life. And so we don't want to just throw the baby out with bathwater and be like, I don't have those ones. So I never need to look at them, but just recognize what they are. So you ready for the first one? Yeah. Uh, just to kind of ask the question though, because I had a question that kind of popped up in my head and I know I had this before. Are you saying that these, um, are you saying that, you know, you might have one that's obvious, but then the other four that you might've went through are kind of buried beneath that. So this is kind of, you're not going to either know, understand, or someone might not know, understand, or even realize that they went through one without breaking through the one that they recognize that they do have? Yeah. So sometimes for some people, it's just kind of like all a mix and it's there and they're like, oh, I have 
all of these. And for other people, it's kind of like segmented into layers. So as we peel back one layer, we find something else underneath. It really depends on how the person stored it. Mm -hmm. um, with, for me, for example, and this can happen with both core childhood wounds and emotions. Uh, this happens a lot for people with emotions where they will have like deep hurt or deep fear. But those are not really emotions that we can take action on. They're more prey emotions. They put us in a very vulnerable state. And so if you have somebody who has potentially been abused or something like I had, we might use a more predatory emotion like anger, which is an emotion we can do something about to dominate the other ones, right? And so it's almost like the anger takes over and it forces all the other ones into uh, hibernation, for lack of a better term, right? Forces mm -hmm. them into being quiet while the anger plays itself out. And so that can happen with our wounds as well. And that's what happened for me. Mine was more in layers, whereas some of my clients, they're like, I know that I have three of these or I know I have five. Yeah, I mean, I didn't even recognize I had one until I didn't even know that this stuff existed um, until I met you. So, um, you know, I think for me, especially like, you know, obviously you're you're the genius specifically around childhood wounds because of how much you studied it. But I think it was, you know, kind of my role with this was like kind of like I don't want to say the guinea pig, but like when it came to like us doing this and you doing this, like I, it's just interesting how mine played out in our story because you know, like when we recognized all of this stuff and now, you know, I mean, you know, now it's kind of like I look at it and I see, especially with my family, like, and, you know, my parents, I see them in a completely different light now that I understand this. And it's not to say that everybody that understands this is going to have a bad relationship with their parents or their family, but understanding it's going to help you see things in a different light, which is ultimately kind of like the entire uh, you know, the entire anchor, the entire thing that you and I look to help people with is, you know, the new life or the, you know, whatever it is that you want to step into. Our goal is to help you step into something that is a lot lighter, a lot more colorful. What I mean by that is, is that you see the world and you see your life in the world a lot differently, which helps you operate daily a lot differently, which changes your life. And this entire process obviously is around taking, being blocked through emotional pain or through, you know, um, you know, like physical, actual blocks of like you were talking about fear, self-doubt, you know, things that prevent us from taking steps forward and being able to make things a lot clearer so that we can understand what's actually going on around us. And for me, at least, if, you know, I know like that literally became walking outside and being like, wow, like, you know, even here in the Smoky Mountains, you know, sometimes I don't recognize how many trees there are. Or, you know, how, you know, how much, how, how much nature and, you know, and, and, and what we've really done. But then like, you know, I know when I first started seeing it, it was just kind of like, whoa, like the trees are really green. The sky, you know what I mean? Like it just made the world look completely differently and all the people they interacted with completely differently. And with that change that, you know, happened through this process, um, you know, like it makes it a lot easier to navigate in the world and to get what you want in the world as well. Yeah. So let's get into what the five core childhood wounds are otherwise yeah. we'll be here all day so number I mean, one I live in the south you know this i could talk to you till midnight i know but people don't want to listen to you and, and me that'd be a long midnight. episode all right so core childhood wound number one is the abandonment wound so with the abandonment wound how is it created it can be that you were actually abandoned, right? Maybe you're, you know, you felt abandoned because your parents gave you up for adoption or because you were left with a family member, a grandparent, an aunt and uncle to be raised. It could even be a parent passed away, okay? But it's also perceived abandonment, which is really what you have, right? You had a family who didn't really understand you. And so you felt abandoned in that way. And it can also be, if I do this, then I will be. So a belief that it will happen. If I, uh, you know, if I- That was my block make for a long time. If I make too much money, then people will abandon me. If I- set boundaries, then people will abandon me, right? So it can be an actual 
physical abandonment. It can be emotional, spiritual, mental abandonment. It can be a perceived abandonment, abandonment or a belief that if you do X, then abandonment will be what follows. I think one that people uh, might relate to a lot, this is this was mine, was I felt like I had to put on a mask. So think of like putting on a mask of like who I thought I was supposed to be to not just people around me, but to my family um, because of what they expected. And I always felt like I was never able to take that mask off and be who I knew that I was. So when push came to shove, it became kind of like, well, am I going to put myself in a, in a cage? Like for a long time, I felt like I was in a cage. And like, that was what I went through is I felt like I was wearing this mask of who my family thought I should be instead of who I knew I was. And then it came down to a point to where it was like, you know, I choose to be free. I choose to, you know, like be who I am. And, you know, even if they don't understand me, because at the end of the day, being who I was, was what made me free. And, you know, being locked up in a mask, AKA a cage, wasn't something that I was willing to, you know, that was really a big part of like getting to a point where I was like this, you know, like I'm, I'm breaking this, like I'm, I'm doing my own thing. This, this can show up in all areas of our life, right? It can, if you believe that if you make too much money, people will abandon you, then you will hold yourself back. This is what I did for a long time. I held myself under a certain financial ceiling because I was, you know, I grew up hearing how awful money was and or how awful people with money were. And so I was like, well, I'll be abandoned. I'll also point out like, None of these wounds are logical, right? I, from as long as I can remember, had no respect for my biological dad. Like I mm-hmm. I would never have said that I love him or even like him. But so logically, I'm like, I, I don't even like this guy. But emotionally, I was like, there are two people in this world who are supposed to love you unconditionally and those are the two the two pieces of dna that came together to form you right Mm -hmm. and for me i was like one of those people a chose my abuser and b like moved to the other side of the country and just stopped caring to contact me and so even though i had this amazing stepdad who who stepped into my life raised me as his own who i love dearly who is you know one of my best friends uh, still felt this abandonment wound and it didn't make sense. And when I, you know, even the one time I did try and have a conversation with my mom about it, she was like, that doesn't even make sense. And I was just like, I I was still young and I didn't understand any of this. And so I was like, okay, well, I just won't talk about it because it's going to make other people upset. Well, isn't so, that, isn't that one of the things that happens though? Cause I know that happened to me. I just got to a point where I was like, I'm just not going to talk about it. I'm just going to yeah. bury and it. And so what's interesting about this wound is that it causes us to abandon ourselves in an attempt to be accepted by others that's a big that's a biggie think about high school here so you know in relationships you might not set boundaries or might not ask to be treated in the way that you desire because Mm -hmm. you're afraid the person will abandon you yeah. And yeah, I mean, even in health, like I've heard, I've, I've worked with people who come from families who are obese or overweight and they've made comments about, well, like if I lose too much weight, then, you know, I'm going to be the outcast of my family. So mm-hmm. the, you know, the three major areas that people have goals in money and career or business two love and relationships, three health, it impacts all those areas. So that's core childhood wound number one number two similar to number one but it's a little bit of a different it's rejection right so i view abandonment as like the person is like smoke bombing out of your life and they're no longer there whereas rejection is more of like the the haters right the i don't like you i'm still gonna you're still gonna see me i'm still gonna be around but now again this can be the actual rejection so somebody saying like no i don't like you turning you down whatever it can be a perceived rejection so maybe you know i had this one growing up where i would call a friend to hang out because we had kind of tentatively made plans right 
my friends would say like, yeah, maybe we can hang out this weekend. And I would take that as a for sure thing. And mm -hmm. I would wait by the phone for them to call me. And then when they wouldn't call me, I took it as a rejection. Mm -hmm. So it could be a perceived rejection or it can be a belief of if I do this, this person will reject me. So if I set a boundary again, in the similar ways that we talked about with the abandonment wound. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think it's interesting with these two, because I, at least in my story, I felt like it started with this, but then it ended up with the abandonment wound. So like, you know, um, I was, you know, at least around the same people we were talking about with my abandonment wound, like, you know, my, my immediate family, a lot of times it was like, you know, I felt like there was a lot of rejection and like you, you saw some of this, right. Where like, I would express some of my opinions about things, specifically about Chad, you know, about our son. And, and it just immediately got rejected and said, or even, or form. even things that were like important to you, right? Like yeah. you would say, this is important to me. And then one of your family members would say like, Oh, nobody cares about that. And I was like sitting there like, wait a second, literally, I literally just, just said, said I cared about, about that. And you're just discounting like what I said. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I think that built help, you know, if we look at these two, like, I think they, at least in my experience, they, they, I don't want to say they were linked, but it was like the rejection got so high that abandonment happened. And I feel like, you know, like uh, nothing was ever done about it, or it was just sort of like swept under the rug by not only the people who did it, but by the people around who saw it being done to a point to where like, you know, abandonment uh, uh, officially kind of happened and, you know, officially, but like eventually kind of happened. Um, and, you know, it, because the rejection had gotten so bad, you know, the, aban the abandonment just sort of easily followed because it just got to a point where it was like, you know, like you obviously, you know, if someone, you, you say this to me all the time, you know, I know you say it on, on social as well, which people really enjoy, but it's like, if someone's going to show you the truth, believe them believe them and for the long time for the longest time i refused to believe it because i had in my head that family doesn't do this family's supposed to be there for each other but what? on a daily basis it got to i was being rejected and i was being misunderstood and um you know eventually once i did start believing it i realized that you know at, at that time when i started believing it they were already gone they had already abandoned so it you know it, it's kind of one of those things i think you know for me, at least like, you know, recognize this rejection because one, you deserve better. You know, anybody deserves better. Like there is a group of people, there is people that will love you, you know, based on what's important to you because what's important to you is more important to other people. And I think it's so important that we find that group of people that understand us. And that was a big deal for you and I, especially when we first got together was, you know, we were around a lot of people that didn't understand us. They, you know, and, and I think like, you know, when we were able to start getting around people that were like, oh, yeah, like, that makes sense to me. Like, I totally dig what you're saying. I totally get, dig your opinion. I totally dig, you know, like, um, what's important to you, like, life gets a lot easier. But I think if we hold on to a false truth that, you know, oh, well, they're looking, you know, like people who are rejecting us or abandoning us, well, they're, they're, they're doing it for the right reasons. No. Yes. Like, you know, like if someone tells you the truth, believe them and then go find, go find, you know, um, you know, go find other people that, um, you know, do that, um, you know, or, or your tribe, I guess. So one thing that is both wild to me with your story, and I see this often with clients, so it shouldn't be wild to me, to me anymore, is that, you know, you expressed, I feel like I've just constantly been abandoned in this family. And what happened was then more family members who didn't have anything to do with the initial issue, then just completely stopped talking to you. Like we had that conversation, I think last year, like imagine Chad saying to us, Hey, I feel like I've been abandoned. And then us like literally abandoning you and then being like, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about and abandoning you. Anyways, it's always crazy to me how that happens in families, but that's a whole other episode. Core childhood wound number three is the humiliation wound. And this is an interesting one. This is the one that came up for me after uh, we had Chad, after I had done a lot of work to work through my abandonment wound. And this one, this one is heavy. This one comes with a lot of shame. And so a lot of people don't want to talk about it. The not good enough is frequently tied to the humiliation wound. 
this shows up in people who are the perfectionists or the know-it-alls. So my humiliation wound really started in junior high um, when, or grade six, really. I had a crush on this guy and I was kind of dorky. Like I had these glasses that were too big for my face. I had a boy haircut. I did not know how to do my hair. I wore hand-me-down clothes from We need to mom. find some old pictures to make sure we put on this video. You know, I wore hand-me-down clothes from my mom's friend at work. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, I was kind of dorky looking. And um, the whole like sixth grade class went on this camping trip for a couple of days. And mm -hmm. we we're camping like 45 minutes from my, from my hometown. And everybody on this camping trip found out who I had a crush on, like the, the most popular boy in school. And me and my best friend had created a nickname for him so that we could talk about him when he was around without anybody knowing. And she ended up, her dad picked her Ooh, up. What it would be her, like to be in high school again. Right. This is sixth grade. Oh, sixth her dad, grade. Yeah. Her dad picked her up from this camping trip. So, but I couldn't go with her because I didn't, you know, my parents hadn't given permission. So I had to ride the bus home for 45 minutes with everybody laughing and making fun of me, throwing things at me. Even teachers were laughing. And I have never wanted to curl up into a ball and disappear so fast. And then I get to junior high and we start having sex ed classes where they don't really teach you anything. So I'd go home and I'd, you know, ask questions. And my parents gave me a book instead of giving me a talk. They gave you a book? They gave me a book, but they wouldn't let me read the majority of the chapters. I, it was like 10 chapters and I was only allowed to read two. And that was really like the female anatomy and the male anatomy. But I didn't understand how they went together. Right. And I oh wasn't smart enough to figure it out at that time. And so I remember we were walking back inside to the school after playing kickball outside for gym class. And my friends were making jokes about sex. And I had no idea what they were talking about. So I just You're 12 years old. Yeah. I had no idea what they were talking about. Canadians are like next <laughs> level. And so I just played along. And then one of them was like, oh, you don't even know what we're talking about. And I just kind of regurg, I was like, yes, I do. And I just regurgitated some stuff that I had heard them saying. And then they were like, oh, okay. But in that moment, I was like, if I don't know the answer to something, then I'm going to get made fun of and it's not safe. And I became this huge know-it-all, this huge perfectionist. So again, it can be like actual humiliation or you believe you're going to be humiliated if, but humiliation wound is the third one. I mean, I think, you know, mine. So we're not even going to get into the sex talk that I got because it was awkward. Um, I remember it very vividly and, uh, it, it was just so bad and so awkward at the same time though. I, you know, I'm counting down the days until I got to give Chad that talk. So I, you know, I gotta, you know, beef up my game, but I think my, you know, my humiliation wound, the big one, I think for me came, you know, like when I was good at something, but then I, I believed that I was good at something. So this actually comes back down to sports. I believed I was really good at something and I was really good at something based on where I was, but then I moved. And when I moved, all of a sudden I went from a big fish in a little pond to a little fish in a huge pond. And I was never taught how to cope with that, especially mm -hmm. at a young age. So, you know, like for me, it was like, I played baseball. And I think it's interesting, you know, because, you know, this year with us in Tennessee and Tennessee just winning the College World Series, woo -hoo, um, you know, I think I, I started falling in love with the game again. Like you and I were watching it. We got super invested with the team. And um, I found myself like it was almost kind of like a step back in time. I was like, I understand this stuff, you know, and I understand what they're doing and everything makes sense. But at the same time, it was like for 20 years now. I rejected the sport because it would bring a lot of shame. It would bring a lot of humiliation to the fact that, you know, could I, would I, how, how far could I have been, you know? And, um, but I got to a point where humiliation came because I, in my brain was like, well, you're supposed to be good. I was told I was good my entire life up into a point. And then I hit a point to where it was like, you're not as good as you think you are. And instead of like, I could have went one or two directions, right. I could have, fought that and gotten better, or I could have shriveled up and quit 
And at that age, I was kind of the direction I took because I didn't have anybody that was there to not only push me, but to help me kind of cope with that. And then came the, you know, the talk of, you know, being a quitter and, and, um, you know, stuff like that. And the truth was, is that was a lot of the talk that was actually developed in my own head based on the family trauma that I had. And I'm not going to dig into like stories, but I mean, just countless times where I would play a game and it was clear that I was getting burnt out of, you know, there's a lot of long string of reasons, but it was clear that I was getting burnt out and that I wasn't having fun anymore. And I'm 12 years old, 13 years old, and I'm playing in like four different leagues. And, you know, like I had gotten to a point where I was like, this isn't fun. Like I did this because it was fun and I was good at it. And now it literally became something that A, wasn't fun to me anymore. And B, you know, like I wasn't as good as, you know, at least in my head. So I didn't have somebody there to encourage. I had somebody there that did nothing but beat me down. And whether it was kids around me or it was my own family who was like, hey, you should be doing better. Hey, you should be happy when you're out there. Hey, all we do is, you know, like spend money and 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 drive you around to do all this stuff. And, you know, da, 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 da. and it's kind of like, well, you know, shouldn't my feelings matter? And like, that's really where my first humiliation wound came from. But it it ended up, um, you know, happening at a little bit of a later age than I think yours did. But I think it happens to a lot of people because, you know, since I never dealt with that, the humiliation wound came back over and over and over again every single time that I didn't feel like I was the best at something. And so that was something that lingered throughout my entire life before I realized what it was. And 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 it really stopped me to do a lot of things or to have fun in a lot of things throughout my entire life because I was constantly humiliated or reliving that humiliation from a young age. Yeah. So the, th the fourth core childhood wound is the betrayal wound. So yeah, also, if dang, all of these are just like hitting home, right? So it's this wound where you believe that you've been betrayed or it could be a perceived betrayal. Or if I do X, then somebody will betray me. Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't so much one that I have had. But if you lack trust in people, you know, this can show up. Um, I had a client a couple of years ago who was running a business and they had taken the business as far as they could on their own. They wanted to make more money because they were, you know, just kind of making enough to have a little bit left over, but not, you know, a ton to do, to go crazy with and invest in, and become wealthy with. So they knew they needed to bring somebody on. And they said, I just, I can't trust people. I can't trust people. They're going to, you know, they're going to let me down, blah, blah, blah. And now, you know, this was a, he brought on a consultant to help him on a per project basis. And I said, now you can either pay them per project, which is going to encourage them to be faster and get things done right the first time, because that's how they get paid, or you can pay them per hour. And so this person decided, this client decided to pay this, you know, the consultant per hour, which was the worst of the two choices, in my opinion. And then he said, you know, he's teaching this person and he taught the person step A, step B, totally forgot to teach step C and then taught step D. So the person that they trained went ahead and did A, B and D. But if you miss C the first time around, it takes more time to undo D, go back and do C and then redo D, right? Mm -hmm. And so he ended up, you know, this project came back late. His client was pissed and he's like, you know, this, I told you hiring people lets them, you know, th they let me down. And I said, but did he let, did, did the person you hire let you down or did your belief that they would let you down cause you to create that as a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So it can stop us from growing our business or delegating aspects of our business or our life and getting the help that we need because we believe we'll be betrayed. I think mean, this one's loopy, like for me, because, you know, I never, uh, similar story, but it was like with our business, right? Like at one point, I think we had like eight or nine staff and, you know, like we went through 30 people to, 
it seemed like over and over and over again. And, you know, like, and then it, once we had like eight or nine staff that kind of didn't work out. And, you know, like, and I sat there and I, you know, to a point I was like, you know, like hiring people, but what it was, was it was the same wound coming back over and over and over again. And what it was for me was trust. It was trusting people and thinking people were going to have my best interest at heart. And, and I kept blaming myself, blaming myself, blaming myself. And I'm not saying I didn't play a role in it. I definitely did. But, um, you know, at the same token, I think like this one can really like get its fingers out into almost everything that you do, because a big part of this life is communication and relationships with people. And if we can't um, communicate properly or have trusting relationships with people and we, sh and we have challenge with that, then um, it can get to a point to where, you know, it can affect everything that we do because that's, you know, we're social beings, right? Like this is part of what we do on a daily basis. So if um, we can't get over this specific wound, it can really, really hold um, a lot of people back for a very long time. And it did for me and um, until, until I was able to break it. All right. Then the fifth and final core wound that we'll talk about today is the injustice wound. So this is where your gender pay gap comes in, you know, the sexism, the racism, the ageism, um, how many you know, isms? The ableisms, there's a lot of isms, but it, <laughs> it, but it's basically like this not fair wound, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, I grew up with my parents telling me, and I had a little bit of this wound, but it, it wasn't really debilitating the way the other ones were for me. You know, I grew up with my parents saying, what goes for one goes for all. I was the oldest and I'm the only girl. So, you know, I had like a nine o'clock curfew in grade 12. I'm not even joking when I say that. <laughs> like, even if I was working at my job, I had to finish I work by 9 a.m. was bad. And then you told me yeah. you had a nine o'clock curfew, like, man, that's but like then, where a lot of things start. My brothers get to high school and they have like a 12, a 2 a.m., you know, um, curfew. I wasn't allowed to drink in high school. It was like, you know, if you, to my brothers, if you guys drink. And, and so it was just like this, you know, well, it's not fair. And so that is the, the last core wound. Yeah, I think um, you were the oldest, but, you know, I can come at this from I was the middle child and I was the only boy. And both of my sisters were like straight A plus students, except for. I think one had a B plus one time and cried for days because that happened. And the other one had a C once in college, I think. And me, let's just be real. I was the straight C student for most of my life. Um, you know, and I think like I got a lot of um, hate on that. Like I remember <clears throat> um, being younger and <clears throat> I remember being younger and being judged by my, by my parents because I wasn't as good as my two sisters and um, I hate, and I don't want to like look back and laugh at it now, but uh, you know, in, in reality here, I'm the only one now that's an entrepreneur. I'm the most successful person that comes from my family, you know, um, or at least from my immediate family. And, you know, like, it's almost kind of like they, they hate that because it's not following kind of like, you know, the other two were so perfect when it came to school and you and I could talk about how school, you know, I think that proves that, you know, school is, is um, well, it's, it's, it's BS in a lot of ways, you know, but, but just one metric. Yeah. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, like I learned a lot about myself and I think like that was kind of like my major lessons. And obviously when I got to college, like I had to teach myself how to learn, which I think was, you know, we could talk about college all day too, but like, that was one of the biggest things that I learned in college was not anything. To do. I don't remember much of what I learned and I have an MBA that's done nothing, but I think that, you know, I learned how to learn and I learned how to learn about myself and I learned more things about myself during that time than I didn't, than anything any, any class taught me. But at the end of the day, I think that, you know, like I got this a lot because my sisters got away with everything, everything. And you even see it to this day, right? Like my sisters are looked at as perfect in my parents' eyes, whereas I was always the one, like if something happened, I, it was always, we're Sid, like what did he do? Even if I wasn't even around or had anything to do with it. And after years of that happening, you know what I mean? Like it became uh, very much something that I almost started accepting, not because, you know, in myself was, it was like, oh, well, if, if something goes wrong, it always has to be Sid's fault. And that was trauma that I ended up carrying for a long time as I always put blame on myself when anything around me would happen wrong. I would immediately stand up and say, well, it was my fault. I, I did this that caused that. And you really were the one that was like, this has nothing to do with you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, stop. 
And, uh, but I think, you know, you probably remember me doing that a lot where it was just sort of something happened. I always blamed myself. And that wound came from what happened when I was really young and um, kind of got me to a point where I was like, you know, there's always, I never understood that mistakes were always going to happen. That's part of the process. I would always almost wait for them to happen so that I could blame myself. And I think I did that because it was safe for me just to go ahead and admit that it was my fault. And um, even though it wasn't, and I put myself in a lot of bad situations and, and, um, and a lot of bad, um, you know, things, you know, that I ended up having to break through growing up because of it. Yeah. So the first place to healing these wounds is recognizing that we have them, recognizing which ones we have. And Journaling then, about them was big for me, just getting them out of my system. Yeah. Going back to understanding where it started, right? And this this includes some of the inner child work that we do is looking at, okay, where did this start? What was the first time that I can remember feeling humiliated or feeling, uh, you know, abandoned or betrayed? And then once we have that awareness, we can start to work through. Now, to go deep into healing these wounds, that is actually something that we walk you through in our Cycle Breaker Society program. It has always been super important to us to provide high quality tools and training to people to know how to navigate their their wounds and their healing journey at a you know very affordable entry price. And so if you are if you have identified with any of these core wounds, go check out the Cycle Breaker Society. We'll put the link for you in the show notes and in the description below. Mm -hmm. If you are committed to breaking the cycle in your own life, we are going to walk you step-by-step -step through how to do that. We're going to give you exercises. We're going to give you worksheets. We're going to give you meditations and hypnosis tracks and everything that you need, uh, you know, Q and A's, all of that that you need to have success on this healing journey? Yeah. I mean, I think um, if you look at the rise method, right? Like, you know, and kind of how it's built, this is at the very, like, it, it will blow your mind how many of your problems, challenges, uh, pain, like for me, it was emotional pain. Like I would hurt inside will go away when you not only identify what these are, and I think it's not even identifying, like, let's be real here. You probably know at least of a couple that you went through and they're going through your head right now. And you're going through these examples, these stories in your head, admitting them to yourself and saying, I went through that is the first step. And I think there's shame when it comes to admitting that, because I think all of us, including me, when I went through this was like, no, I grew up in a perfect family and I grew up in a perfect life. And I'm so lucky that I, you know, and this, that, and the other, it doesn't mean you didn't go through trauma. You know, it doesn't mean that you didn't go through something that you've been carrying along with you for a long time. So I care I personally carried a lot of this with me. And it wasn't until I admitted to myself and I began working through these, which as Tiffany said, through hypnosis, through a, a lot of the exercises that we provide now, did things ever get better? But then once I realized that most of my challenges and most of my negative loops. And things that I would get stuck in came from these childhood wounds because these were what happened when I was really young and then just perpetuated. Um, did I realize that things would get a lot better? Because at the end of the day, if we can rip these out, the other negative loops that we get caught up in, the challenges that we got get caught up in, the blocks and the emotional trauma and the emotional pain that we get caught up in comes from these five. So it's, it's admitted to ourselves, identify what they are and get to work on it because the sooner we get to work on it, the sooner, to be honest with you, we feel a lot more free, but just a lot more clear. I think for these made me a lot more clear. That gave me a lot more clarity around what I wanted. Absolutely. And we would love to have you join us in the Cycle Breaker Society to help you fill up. Well, we have been going, this is almost a 45 minute episode. So we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we would love, like I said, to see you in the Cycle Breaker Society with us, help you walk through this journey of healing these wounds so that you can completely transform your life. You can find all those details in the show notes. Until next time, thank you so yeah. much for joining us and we'll talk to you soon. Later.